I will take advantage of this nice opportunity to talk to you about uh, uh, our one of our latest work in, in my lab that is located in this corner of Spain, the Basque country, where the Basque uh, government make uh, an effort to, uh, to promote research in, 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 biosciences, in biosciences and build this, this building and institute uh, 10 years ago in an area close to Bilbao. Probably you know Bilbao because, because of the Guggenheim, Guggenheim effect that put Bilbao in the world uh, map, right? And um, my, the work we, current, we do in my lab is mostly focused on these two systems. ING proteins that come from inhibitors of growth are form part of chromatin remodeling complexes that recruit histone uh, histone acetyl transferases to chromatin uh, sites and acetylates uh, histones at lysine residues. This has an impact in, in transcription regulation and they have been um, proposed to be tumor suppressors. This is the structure of one of these ING uh, proteins that is a, a homodimer that binds um, histone 3 tail trimethylated at lysine 4. This is a model of how we think this uh, tumor suppressors bind, bind nucleosomes. And the other major project is, a, is the structure and function of the proliferating cell nuclear antigen, known as uh, PCNA, which is the eukaryotic DNA sliding clamp. It's an essential factor for DNA replication and repair, and also a pharmacological target in, in cancer. Both kind of molecules, ING, tumor suppressors, and PCNA, uh, come together when replication uh, starts, because for the formation of the origin of replication complexes, the chromatin needs to be relaxed, and this is achieved by acetylation of histones that removes positive charge from the histone, and then the, the chromatin becomes less compact, and then the origin, rep the origin of replication complex may assemble, and replication can uh, proceed. PCNA is this ring shaped molecule, has uh, this, this structure, it's a homotrimer with a ring shape and a large hole in the middle. Although it is known that DNA goes inside the ring, there is no crystal structure so far of DNA bound to PCNA. And it has been uh, measured in single molecule studies that PCNA diffuses passively on the DNA, so the interaction with DNA is very weak. This is the structure of the bacterial sliding clamp, the E. coli beta clamp bound to a prime DNA. It has also a, a ring shape, but in this case, it was uh, possible to crystallize the complex with DNA, indicating that the interaction, the PCNA DNA are not so weak, uh, not so weak here. PCNA then is the eukaryotic sliding clamp, and it, it's mainly a platform where many different DNA modifying enzymes bind. Different polymerases, endonucleases, like the flam, flap endonuclease 1, and ligases, like ligase 1, that um, joins the Okazaki fragment. PCNA peaks in the S phase of the cell cycle, where DNA, where DNA synthesis um, takes place. And um, in fact, PCNA was discovered in the 70s as a marker for breast cancer because it's highly abundant in cells that proliferate quickly because they need to synthesize a lot of, of DNA. Later on, it was found that PCNA was involved in DNA replication, DNA repair, etc. And uh, not only it binds a lot of DNA modifying enzymes, but also some re cell cycle regulators like the CDK, cyclin dependent kinase inhibitor P21 that arrest cell cycle progression. P21 is an intrinsically disordered protein. It has not been possible to analyze the full length protein because it tends to aggregate. We have tried and we have not been able, but it seems that it is intrinsically disordered. But its C terminal fragment binds to PCNA in a defined conformation, and it was possible to crystallize the uh, complex with, um, 
with uh, PCNL. It was found that there are three equivalent sites in the PCNL ring for P21, and the, the PCNL structure is mostly unchanged, so there is no sign of uh, cooperativity or allostery. Since then, other fragments of PCNA binding proteins have been crystallized together with PCNA. Here there is a superposition of the fragment of P21, flap endonucleus 1, and the subunit P66 from polymerase delta, and they fall when bound to PCNA in a, in a, in a, in a similar way. These peptides contain a common and conserved sequence motif, that is, named the PCNA interacting protein motif that consists of a glutamine, Na2 residues, an aliphatic hydrophobic residue, Na2 residues, and two aromatic residues, typically phenylalanine or tyrosine. This PIP motif is present in many proteins that bind to PCNA, but not all the proteins that are reported to PCNA contain this, uh, this motif. For those complexes on which precise thermodynamic measurement has been done by calorimetry, it has been found that the stoichiometry is one to one, one PIP fragment to one PCNA protomer, three PCNA protomers in the PCNA ring. The dissociation constant is in the range of nanomolar to micromolar. The lowest, the higher affinity, the highest affinity has been measured for P21, which is around 80 nanomolar. And this is probably why P21 can compete with any other PCNA ligand and probably contributes to its effect arresting the cell cycle because it blocks PCNA as a platform for docking polymerases. Other PCNA binders that has been, whose affinity has been measured have much lower affinity than PCNA. And for all of them, there is no signs of cooperativity as measured by calorimetry. So we, some time ago, we thought that it would be good to uh, study PCNA interactions in solution by NMR because it would allow to observe the binding in solution. We could also monitor the dynamics, not only the structure. NMR is very sensitive to, to a very wide range of binding affinity, so we, 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 we might be able to study and understand competition between different ligands, and we could also perform some ligand screening. As I told you, PCNA is a pharmacological target. PCNA is very big for NMR. 90 kilodalton protein is, um, is challenging, and especially if, um, if you add uh, a ligand that increases the molecular size. And it's it's in, although there are spectroscopical techniques to overcome this problem associated with um, molecular size in NMR is, uh, is very detrimental. Um, it also it requires the preparation of high amounts of pure protein with uh, this isotopical um, enrichment. We need to enrich the protein in deuterium, carbon centering, and nitrogen 15 in NMR to apply this this technique. Fortunately, we. We, we could take advantage of clones and protocols for expression and purification that were set up for the crystal and for the crystallization, and also the crystal structure is very helpful for analyzing the NMR spectrum. Anyway, we managed to assign the NMR spectrum of uh, PCNA. Here is a typical fingerprint of the uh, mm, pro correlation between protons and nitrogen, which are represented in these two uh, axes, and each of these signals corresponds to one amino acid of, PC of PCNA. This is because in any polypeptide chain, all the re every residue contains an NH group, and the, and the resonances of the proton and the nitrogen of each NH group give rise to this uh, signal spot in the proton-nitrogen correlation map. The big tax here is to put a label to all of these spots. This label corresponds to the amino acid to which this NH uh, belongs. Once you achieve this, to assign the spectrum, you can use this map to, 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 to extract a lot of useful information. But to, to reach this uh, state uh, requires a significant amount of, of, of work. But we managed to assign the NMR spectrum of uh, of PCNA, and not only that, we could confirm that in solution, the tertiary and quaternary st structure of the PCNA was consistent 
with the crystal structure. We did not determine the structure of PCNA in solution. This would have been a very difficult task, but at least we could detect short distances between residues in the beta sheets that indicate that the tertiary structure is the same, and also in bet between short distances between the two beta sheets that um, are at the interprotomer, um, in, in, at, the at the interface between protomer. Um, because uh, the structure is the same as in the crystal structure, we see this kind of spectrum. And it is because PCN is a symmetric homotrimer. So each residue in each of the protomers is chemically equivalent. And this is the reason why we observe only one signal for a given residue. The same residue in the three protomers is chemically identical and we observe a single signal. And this simplifies a lot NMR because if it not were a symmetric homotrimer, we would get three signals for every residue. So although the protein is 90 kilodalton, the spectral complexity is that of a 30 kilodalton protein. And we could analyze the internal dynamics of the protein in solution by using a special NMR measurement based on nitrogen 15 relaxation and we could see several regions where the backbone was much more dynamic than other paths. Not surprisingly these highly dynamic regions were loops or the C terminus while the secondary structure elements were more rigid. Now we have our NMR spectrum of PCNA carai. Can we use it to monitor interaction? Yes, as shown by this slide. Um, we use as a test model to how far we could go to analyze interaction by using the complex of PCNA bound to flap endonuclease 1. This is the only structure known of a full length protein bound to PCNA. And you can see that uh, comparing black signals, PCNA alone, with red signals, PCNA bound to three flap endonuclease proteins, you observe that many signals disappear. This is due to the increase in molecular size of PCNA. PCNA is 90 kilodalton, gives a nice spectrum, but when it goes to 214 kilodalton, the complex is too big for NMR observation, and many signals disappear. But this is an indication of binding. If we use a simpler model, like the P21 short fragment that, that contains the pip box, we do not observe signal disappearance, but we observe signal shifting. Many signals of free PCNA experience a shift in their proton and nitrogen frequencies when bound to P21. So this is also a strong well, a demonstration of binding. But because we know to which signal, in P to which residue in PCNA this signal belongs, by analyzing these shiftings, we can map the binding site and even calculate a KD. So we analyze this shifting of the signals in PCNA upon binding to P21. And we are representing the shifting against the amino acid residue. And you can see that there are some regions that change a lot, some others do not. And this allow us to map on the PCNA protomer structure here in green where the um, P21 peptide band binds. The magenta and, and orange colors show the residues that change the most and they uh, are consistent with the crystal structure of the P21 peptide band to PCNA, which is here shown in, in Siam. So we can detect binding and map, uh, and map the, the binding site. When we apply this same technique to the PIP fragment of ING1, one of these ING proteins that are involved in chromatin remodeling, we could see almost no chemical shift perturbation, no shifting, even at very high excess of the peptide. This peptide contains a PIP motif. Although this aromatic residue is availing, it is described as a PIP motif. But binding is extremely weak. Taking advantage of this 
minor perturbation, we could do a titration and estimate that the binding constant is in the millimolar range. So it binds, but it's extremely weak. This was unexpected because ING1 was reported to bind to PCNA by co-immunoprecipitation. It was found in, in, in cellular assays to compete with P21. So we expected, and it contains a PIF motif, we expected to see a direct interaction, but if there is an interaction, it's extremely weak. Probably it's not biological relevant. This may be because we choose a fragment of P21. Maybe another regions of P21 are necessary, but we found the same result for several other proteins reported to bind to PCNA. This happened with the globular domain of MCL1, reported to bind to PCNA by co-immunoprecipitation. This happens also with the full-length CDK2 protein, reported to bind to PCNA by surface plasma resonance and by pull-downs. This happened also with this protein, GAT45 alpha, just to hybrid co-IP, ELISA, so binding to PCNA, but in solution by NMR we don't see any binding. There is no perturbation of the PCNA residues in the presence of an excess of this protein. MCA1 contains a P box, not very well concerned, the others do not. So, I, I think that in solution there is no direct interaction with this protein. If there is an interaction, it's extremely weak. We can put a lower uh, threshold, the interaction, the, the, affinity, the KD is higher than about 800 micromolar here, about 260 here, and higher than 900 micromolar here if there is interaction. So why this might happen? Well, it may be that these interactions do not report a direct one. It may, may be mediated by another factor. It may be that these interactions in the cells involve post-translational modification. Well, it may be. It was uh, surprising and a little bit uh, frustration not to be able to characterize these interactions in, in solution, but the conclusion is that there is no direct interaction between these this, uh, several panels. But then we, um, we look, well, we found in the literature this uh, other protein that was um, um, it's it's, uh, it is abundant at the same cell cycle phases as uh, PCNA. It has been reported by uh, just to have it and coimmuna precipitation to bind PCNA. It contains a big box. It's very relevant in cancer. It's proposed to be an oncogene because it's overexpressed in several cancer types, and uh, the levels correlate with poor prognosis. And uh, it has been proposed that regulates DNA repair during replication, using different kind of uh, experiments in, in cells. This crude model was, was proposed by Nils, uh, by Nils Mylan, in which uh, say normal replication proceeds with P15 bound to PCNA in a ubiquitilated state, two licenses are ubiquitilated, and uh, upon DNA damage, for instance, the P15, P15 is, is, is removed by a proteasomal degradation um, route, and then this facilitates requiting of repair polymerases, translation repair polymerases. When this is repaired, normal replication proceeds with ubiquitilated P15 bound to PCNA. So it's a very crude model that based on uh, results suggesting that P15 helps the transition from replicating to repaired uh, polymerase. P15 is predicted to be intrinsically disordered. And uh, the first thing we do was, we, we was to characterize uh, P15 by itself. It's a small protein and indeed it is intrinsically disordered as can be seen by its NMR spectrum, this proton nitrogen spectrum. All the mm, signals, most of the signals, appear in a very narrow range of proton frequencies, typical of proteins without structure. A small angle X-ray data, scattering data also indicate that it is intrinsic disorder, but it's not a complete random coil because some particular NMR measurements, T2 relaxation measurements, are not uniform along P15 sequence. And disorder prediction also suggests that there are some regions with less tendency to be disordered. 
more sophisticated NMR measurements also suggest that there are regions with deviates from random code. Just look at the black points, which are the experimental measurements, and the red line, which, uh, sorry, the blue line, which is the simulated values for a completely random coil. You can see that there are regions where the experimental black points do not match the simulated values for a random coil. If you introduce in the, in the modeling conformational preferences in the form of a little bit of strand here, 50% helix here, 15% helix here, extended strand to here, you can get this predicted value, the red one, that best matches the experimental value. So this suggests that in these regions, there is a small conformational preference for secondary structure, not a complete random coil. Therefore, P15 may be a very dynamic, mostly random structure in solution, but any, at any time, any one conformer contains a partial, a, an extended region here, a helical region here, in very fast exchange, in very dynamic equilibrium. So, um, it is an integral of the protein with some confirmation of pressure. Does it bind PCNA? Yes, this protein do bind PCNA, at least directly in solution, as the NMR spectrum of P15 here in, in, in black changes in the presence of PCNA in red. Um, looking at the spectrum of PCNA here in black, it also changes in the presence of P15 here in red. And there are much more changes in the presence of P15 than with P21, suggesting that the binding is different. If we look more in detail to certain NMR parameters measured in the spectrum of P15 in the absence and the presence of PCNA, we can see that most of the changes are located in this central region where the PIP box sequence is. In fact, many, several of, many of these central residues disappear when bound to DNA. By calorimetry, we could see that P15 binds with a KD of 1.1 micromolar at 25 degrees with a stoichiometry of 1. No cooperativity. And based on this NMR data, we design a peptide fragment spanning these uh, residues and found that it binds with slightly reduced affinity with the same stoichiometry. So this short fragment somehow recapitulate most of the determinants for the, the binding. We tried to crystallize P15 bound to PCNA with no success. Probably because, apart from this central region tightly bound to PCNA, the N and C terminal regions are floppy, dynamic, and difficult and hampering crystallization. But with this shorter fragment designed based on the NMR data, we could crystallize the complex. But to our surprise, only two P15 molecules were in the complex. One of the PCNA protomer was empty. This is due to a crystal artifact, a nearby, a nearby molecule containing a loop that will clash with the peptide if it were here. In fact, it's also clashed with one of the loops of PCNA and it's also distorted. So crystal structure shows two molecules, but, by, but NMR and calorimetry and ambiguously shown so that there are three P15 bound to, to the PCNA ring. This is the structure of P15 central region bound to to PCNA, and the first thing we realize is there is little or no correlation with the conformational properties of the isolated P15. This the small conformational preferences that I saw in free P15 do not appear to be present in the bound form. Most importantly, the structure of, um, of P15 is different from that of P21. While P21 also has this short helix here, in the P15, there are a type 1 beta 2 that reverses the direction of the change and produces the end terminus to go inside the ring. And this is an, an unusual feature in P15. In PCNA binding proteins, most of them, the, most of those, had, well, all of them that has been characterized by crystallography, bind to one of the phases of the ring, but they ends wander off the ring, while 
P15 and terminus go inside the ring. So this suggests that the end terminus of P15 goes to one side of the ring while the C terminal remains at the other side of the ring. We confirm uh, another important point is that if we had chosen a P15 fragment just based on P21, we would have missed this important detail. It is because we analyzed first full length P15 that we could design a peptide and later through crystallization saw this, see this uh, unusual binding mode. Anyway, this is the suggestion from the crystal structure of the fragment, but we could, confirm, we could confirm that this is the case with full length P15 because NMR analysis showed in the presence of full length P15 that not only the front side of the ring was perturbed here in red, but also residues at the back side of the ring here in red were perturbed in the presence of the full length protein. Combining this X-ray structure, NMR perturbations in solution with computer simulations of thousands of P15 conformers, this model uh, appears. Tightly bound P15 in the central region through the through of the protomer and the C-terminal and N-terminal disorder tails at each side um, of the ring. Furthermore, we found that P15 binds DNA. Uh, this was seen by fluorescent polarization experiments uh, showing that P15 binds DNA with low micromolar, low micromolar affinity <coughs> and mm, to this binding mostly contributes the N-terminal uh, region because a deletion mutant shows an affinity much uh, smaller. This is confirmed by NMR where most of the perturbations in the presence of DNA are in the N-terminal tail, while where many positively charged residues, lysines and arginines, um, are perturbations are smaller in the other region of the protein. The short, shorter fragments of P15 bind with much less affinity, and PCNA itself does not bind DNA. When P15 is bound to PCNA, it also binds DNA with similar affinity. And when P15 is bound to DNA, it also binds PCNA with a similar affinity, one micromolar to micromolar. So that means that P15 interacts simultaneously and independently with DNA and PCNA. The NMR spectrum of the ternary complex here in blue resembles that of P15 PCNA in red, suggesting that the mode of binding of P15 to PCNA is the same going through the ring. However, a detailed analysis of this blue spectrum is, is not possible because it's too complicated. To, with the, in the presence of the, of, the, of the DNA, the spectral quality is very much <coughs> degraded. So we did a modeling of, mm, of the ternary complex with the DNA in the middle of the ring to see if this would be feasible from a steric and energetic consideration. And um, it is the conformational model of the ternary complex in this way refined by molecular dynamics simulation so that three P15 molecules bound to a ring can coexist with a DNA double helix running through the center of the of PCNA. And this could be very relevant for DNA replication. We try to confirm experimentally this hypothesis, well this hypothesis, this conclusion from different pieces of information by using electron microscopy. And we obtain evidence that this kind of molecules exist in solution. If you see, uh, if you see these images here of the ternary complex, you can see some rings with an extra density in the middle, this is negative staining, that is not seen when PCNA is in the presence of P15, because P15 does not provide a lot of mass in the center of the ring, and is also not present in the mixture of PCNA and DNA. We know that PCNA and DNA do not bind in the absence of P15. So this density in some of the images in the electron microscopy graphs of the ternary complex demonstrate that some of the specimens, some of the molecules in, in the, in the um, 
and our solution look, look like this. We must be careful with this because the, we cannot say that this is the structure of the ternary complex. Yeah? On one hand, for the same reason that this is not a pipe, this is just a representation of a pipe. But not only for that, but also because we know that in the in the NMR2 we have three molecules alone, but in the cell there are many different PCNA interacting proteins with different sizes, with different affinities, maybe with different uh, different presence along the cell cycle. So um, <coughs> we think that the relevance of this of our finding the constant of the of the cell may be something like this. If you imagine polymerase delta that contains several subunits, very big, at least two of them with a PIP motif able to interact with uh, PCNA, not more than one polymerase delta can, bound, can be bound to the PCNA, but there is room for P15 to bind simultaneously because of its intrinsic disorder. Because we have found that P15 binds DNA and this binding is mostly located in the N-terminus, and we know that the N-terminus of P15 is at the other side of the ring, we can propose that in this situation P15 and terminal tail will bind the DNA at the other side of the, of the ring, at the, at the rear side of the replication direction, let's say. And we can propose that if P15 is ubiquitylated, not 100% of P15 in the cell is ubiquitylated, but um, a lot of it is ubiquitylated. This ubiquitylation at the end, at two lysis and the end terminus, will very likely reduce the affinity for the DNA because of aesthetic reasons and also because of removal of one positive charge of, uh, upon ubiquitylation. In this way, we propose that P15 might regulate the velocity of PCNA sliding on the DNA, slowing uh, sliding in this state and accelerating sliding when it is ubiquitylated. And this may have an impact on the velocity of replication. Here, replication could go s in, in slower than here. Because of this reported effect of P15 degradation uh, under UV irradiation, this transition from slow to fast replication in the presence of P15 may have something to do with this facilitation of replication to repair, recruiting polymerase, replicating, replicating polymerases to recruiting uh, translation synthesis polymerases. Maybe, I think this is a very crude uh, model, very crude hypothesis that needs to be validated by people that know how to do this kind of uh, cell biology assays. And this may be, this regulation of velocity may also be important for uh, replicating a huge genome like the human genome. Uh, the mean diffusion of coefficient of PCNA along DNA has been measured and is, um, is very high, much mm, higher than uh, the sliding of the, of the bacterial bacterial clamp. So DNA has to diffuse very, very quickly on the human genome and then a mechanism for regulating the velocity um, would be helpful. While in a bacteria, for instance, this uh, velocity not, does not need to be so fast and a regulation mechanism may not be necessary. And this is the summary of the main conclusions of uh, my talk. As I have uh, shown you, uh, we have not been able to confirm in solution by NMR some reported direct uh, interactions um, indicated that they are not direct or they are mediated by other factors. Um, <coughs> our characterization of PVT shows that it is intrinsically disordered, although conformational preferences do exist. However, these conformational preferences we have detected seem to be unrelated with its binding to PCNA, may be relevant for other binding events, we don't know. P15 binds PCNA by central, flux, uh, central region and the disorder and terminal and terminal tail remain flexible on both sides of the, of the rim. We have found that P15 binds independently and simultaneously both to DNA and um, PCNA 
and we propose that it may regulate the, the sliding velocity of uh, PCNA on the DNA in a ubiquitylation dependent manner. To this work has contributed many people, uh, mostly uh, Alfredo when he was working in, in my lab, together with uh, other members of the group, particularly Alain Ibanez Opakwa, and many others. I would like to uh, highlight Ramon Campos, who, who was the person who suggested to use uh, PCNA as a molecule protein involving cancer that could be uh, studied by, by NMR. And because we have needed to combine many different techniques, we needed to um, involve uh, many collaborators that provided the expertise we didn't have. Tamo Diaz at the NMR platform of Thick Bio Una uh, helped us a lot with some tricks, uh, NMR, NMR tricks. David Hill and Sandra Delgado at the electron microscopy platform of the Bio Una helped us with the electron microscopy. The group of Guillermo Montoya, um, first at the CNIO and then at the University of Copenhagen, helped us a lot with the crystallography. Tiago Cordero and Pau Bernardo with the small angles of ray scattering and computational simulations. And Francisco Castilla and Irene Luque at the University of Granada provided the expertise for the calorimetry measurement. And with this I am finished and I, am th I thank you very much for your attention.